reluctance to go to New York. No, I never wanted to come here. I tried everything I could to not come. I was calling all around, <laughs> trying, trying not to come to New York. I felt like you don't get any grace with the media. And then, you know, G and A-Rod had their thing going on in the clubhouse. I was like, I don't want to be no part of that. It ended up being the best decision we made 15 years later. Samantha with his fifth strikeout ends the fifth. Strike three, drop down the three. He's a bad guy. I'm on the scouting report. Wait. What's up, everybody, and welcome to another boardroom out of office, my first out of office on the roof of our building in Chelsea, New York City. And today, I have two very special guests and two very good friends of mine. A lot of people refer to them as the first couple of baseball. I'm rocking with it. I think it's an incredible title. Please welcome to the show, Cece and Amber Sabathia. Guys, thank you so much for joining me. No thank problem. you for having us. Yeah. We're excited to be here. Do you get interviewed a lot together? Not, not as much. It's one or the other. I don't, yeah, I don't know when the last time we got interviewed together. Yeah, it's been a long time. Like, it's usually the family. It's never just us doing like a, yeah. All right, well, it's a little couples therapy. I appreciate the, you putting uh, my I name know, first, because it's always Amber and Cece and not Cece and Amber, so. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Amber and Cece Sabathia. We are one, it doesn't even we matter. We are one yeah. 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 So when you hear, like, jokes aside, the first couple of baseball, because I actually, when we reached out to you guys, I was like, just came to me that it obviously is what people see you as, I think, especially in America. Do you feel pride in hearing something like that? Is it weird for you guys? Super weird. Super weird. I hate it. But I love that you see us like that. Um, I think there's so many people in the game that came before us that paved the way of why we're here today and can, can kind of rock with that title. Um, but there's so many people in the game that kind of have helped us get to where we are. So I don't want to take any shine from anybody else. Yeah, and for me, I look at couples like, you know, Billy and Hank Aaron and, you know, Jackie and, and Rachel Robinson. And those yeah. who we try to model our relationship and our business in baseball after. So, um, yeah, we love, I mean, it's, it's a great compliment, but it is super weird for us to hear that because there are so many different, um, you know, bigger couples that, you know, came before us. But I mean, you know, we'll take it. <laughs> I see it as this thing where in a lot of ways, it's like, it's not up to anybody, including you guys, and I'll explain, to almost say that. It's almost like the game is saying that, the sport is saying that a bit, because I didn't even know Hank Aaron's wife's name. You know what I'm saying? And I didn't know Jackie Robinson's wife's name. Obviously, what they did for the game and what they did for society is well documented, but I think there is something magical about the two of you, and it's something that I think because people do love baseball, right? Like, if someone said to me, MLB is going away, I'd be like, what are you talking, like, hell no. But I don't watch games, right? So it's like we still hold the sport in this special place, and I think that's why people have kind of looked to you guys as like, all right, well, we know Amber and CeCe, right? Because like the familiarity with players across the board is not that great and you've been out of the game for a while, you're working as an agent and so many other things, but people still see you guys in a lot of ways as the face of baseball. Do you see that as some of your responsibility when you first retired? Did you think about how people see you and how important the game was to so many people for you to try to carry that on? You know what, honestly I didn't, and I didn't know what I was gonna do in retirement. You know, I knew I still wanted to be around the game. I didn't know how important the game was to me. You, you know what I mean? Like, I didn't know um, how much I loved the game. I knew that she wanted to become an agent. I knew my son was going to be on this journey. But I thought, like, once I retired, like, oh, I'm done with baseball. Like, I lived that life. But, no, I'm a baseball lifer. Like, it's in my blood. Like, I love being around the stadium. I love working at Central Baseball um, and having a hand in what goes on kind of day to day with the league. Like, we're a baseball family. And um, for the longest time, I think I tried to fight that. Um, but now just getting into the second half of my life, it, it kind of is who, who we are. Yeah, I mean, I feel the whole reason I became an agent isn't because, I mean, we were blessed with his career that financially I didn't have to work, right? So that's the number one question I get all the time. Why are you an agent? You don't have to be. Well, Beyonce doesn't have to go on tour, but yet she does, right? Yeah. Like when it's your passion and your purpose and you're good at it, and I'm really good at what I do, that I knew that this is what this is what our purpose was. So for CC mentoring the, the next generation and helping them on the field, for me, I, I love mentoring and helping them off the field. And together, yeah. it's just it's a dynamic duo. Do you did you have this plan for yourself throughout 
his time in the league and through your relationship that post career this was something you could do or did you know you were good from the role you played in Cece's life? Yeah, uh, and actually Cece's the one who, who like brought it up to me. Um, I really wanted to work in philanthropy and help athletes with their nonprofits and how to n not start a 501c3 because not every athlete is equipped to start a 501c3, um, but how so many want to go back to their hometowns and give back. And I told Cece, I'm gonna start, before he even retired, I started working with Aaron Judge and Dee Dee and Aaron Hicks and you know, working with other athletes and helping there with, with their philanthropic endeavors. And I told Cece that and he goes, you know what? Like you rocked with me definitely towards the end of my career. He's like, you would be an amazing agent. He was like, and, I, and of course I was like, no one's gonna like, you're Cece's wife. And I just started looking into it and I realized, yes, I could be really good at this. And he's really the one who put the battery in my back and pushed me to do it. You know, I, I actually refer to him as Amber's husband. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of people do that. I do that. <laughs> um, so you, you talked about like the why. So the, this, the why was building up for you. Yeah. Um, are you guys, and I know the answer to this, but how different do you guys feel like you are now from when you first met and started dating in high school? Oh, we grew up together. So we're totally different than when we first met in high school. Yeah. But together we were able to grow up. So we were able to go through so many different things, especially in his career, because the game is a roller coaster. It's so many ups and downs on the field and personally. And we were able to get through that together and grow up together. So I think where we are now are two totally different people, but we respect each other enough to, to continue in our lives together. Yeah, so. I have a question, it's personal. I, I mm -hmm. hope you guys are okay answering. I've been married for 20 years this November 1st, and it's just tough. Congrats. Marriage is Congrats. Tough. Yeah. The hardest thing I've ever done. All right. yeah. Do you think it's like something that goes too much without being said, how tough that balance is as a professional athlete and having a relationship that's endured. And obviously, like every relationship, you go through ups and downs. Was it actually just super hard being that you were a professional athlete and on the road? Did it make it so much more difficult? No, the road didn't make it difficult. No, I think, I think just marriage is hard in general. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think the road made it harder than it would have been if I was home all the time. I don't think the career made uh, makes marriage hard i think it's the person it's the respect you have for each other it's getting through things with each other and supporting each other to get through those things yeah. um i mean i just like we we pretty much we argue all the time like you know what i'm saying <laughs> like it's a daily thing where we're like bickering back and forth but we are best friends we're like we laugh really hard together every day too you know what i'm saying so it's a it's a good balance of you know being able to live with my best friend she is the only person though she knows me like that i can be around for like a, a week? A week straight and not get tired of. <laughs> like, I, you know, I can't go on a trip with Pekka's for more than three days. You know what I'm saying? Like, so my, like, I, All she, his close she's friends. the only person I can be with, like, every single day and not get tired of. That's amazing. That might, yeah. <laughs> and I know that, too. Do you take the, did you take the game home? Were you one of those athletes? No, I wasn't. I wasn't. Uh, once it was done, because um, I had kids so early and so young in my life that once the game was over, once we crossed the bridge, it was over for me. So like I came out of the game, my kids didn't care if I threw a no hitter, if I gave up seven runs. Like it's dad's home and it's time to hang out. So that was always a great balance for me. If I didn't have my family, the way I competed, it would have been too much for me, especially with the drinking and everything. Like I would have been taking everything home a lot more than I did. But I mean, if we get in the car, I'll be pissed. And then as soon as we cross the bridge, it's like, I gotta let it go. And you started, your career started pre-social media, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is big, because I, I I was watching that show, Winning Time, and yeah. they canceled it, and there was a scene where like the Lakers had just gone down 3-1 to the Celtics, and they were having like a family dinner, and the father was like, you know what it is, now you're home, it's family time, don't worry about your work. And I was like, I wonder if that was like the expectation in yesteryear, back to in the day. To being able to separate it. To really separate it, whereas now like, you know, it's pretty much impossible and I'm sure you see it with your young athletes like it's probably way harder to not take the game home unless you don't have your phone in your hand and unless you don't have social media because somebody's going to tweet at you somebody's going to you post a picture you going to dinner after a bad game somebody's going to say you should have made this shot you should have hit you got this hit or made this pitch so yeah I mean I, I would imagine it has to be harder to be an athlete now because everybody's you know in your face at once to know what you're doing behind the scenes yeah. and, you know, want to know what you're eating for dinner after a game. Like where, when I was a kid, I, I mean, I didn't care what Michael Jordan was eating. You know what I mean? Like I got to see him at, on NBC 
or maybe, you know, inside basketball with a mile shot, and that was it. Like, there was nothing else. Like, I didn't know he played golf or any of these things. Like, now you know so much about your favorite player that, you know, it, it, it makes it hard to kind of separate work from, yeah. you know, your personal life. So your son is like a prospect, is somebody that is attacking the game, has a special gift. Does the title you think of first family of baseball, whether it's like real or not, help him? Does it hurt him? Does it worry you guys? It's, it's just all part of being a Sabathia. And I think he's, he's extremely humble. He takes it. He knows he has to make a name for himself. He strives. I mean, he's a hitter. He's not a pitcher for that purpose. He never, he didn't want to always be compared to his dad. Um, and I do think it's harder for him. Um, but I also think it's going to help him a lot as well in his career, having that legacy of the Sabathia name. So, you know, it, it's turned into truly like a family business for us. You know what I mean? Like baseball is our business, whether it's CC me, our son, our youngest son that's coming up young. It's our business. And um, I think all our kids know that and they and they wear it on their sleeve like they, they're proud of it, but they're also very humbled by it. Do your girls like the sport and play softball? No. No? <laughs> they don't. <laughs> they love to travel and like the lifestyle of the big leagues, but they didn't really yeah, like Yeah, no, they're dancers, musical theater. Our oldest daughter's a senior this year. She's going to college. She's looking at NYU and Emerson. And so they all have their own path for sure. But like they couldn't even tell you like what team plays in Detroit. You know what I mean? Like my girls, they just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not that serious for them. Do you have a hard time? speaking to him as parents and separating it from an agent and you know a future hall of famer not me uh me and him have a great relationship and it's because i never coached him so i never like was i mean i'm invested super invested because it's my kid and you know i want him to do great and i think he's going to do great but i'm i'm not like analyzing his swing or breaking down different things like so it's more of like a, a conversation we get to have about baseball and now that he's older it's like great conversation. It's like a conversation I would have with like some of my teammates now. You know what I mean? Like talking about the game or talking about his at bats. Like we got a chance to go and to Martha's Vineyard this summer and be with him and actually watch him play. And like after every game, I'm sitting down with him, you know, breaking down at bats and just getting a chance to really talk about the game because we didn't have that time because when he was growing up, I was out playing, you know? So I didn't get a chance to really break down the game with him. So now, it's like having like a little buddy to yeah. talk to the game about. So it's uh, it's fun. That's probably like your last few years in the league, the young guys in the locker room and the clubhouse giving you that energy. Yeah, for sure. And I think like for him, he'll be closer to Aaron Judge or Aaron Hicks, you know, because he grew up coming in the clubhouse when those guys were young. So by the time he gets to the big leagues, he'll have those relationships with those guys. What's the process and trajectory for a young baseball player now? Is it the same blueprint do you have to go through the system you can get no, drafted out of high school has yeah. it changed a bit oh it's changed there's many different paths you can take but the end goal is always mlb yeah. and it's hard to explain to these younger guys when you ask the relationship him and i have it's more uh advisor and mom and I, you can never take the mom away i mean mom's always going to be there but there's nil deals now and it's me calling him and you know saying you should really do this nil deal and he's like i don't want to do it I, you know and having to divide okay as a mom you don't want to do it but as your advisor i'm telling you, you should you need to do it and yeah you could now get drafted out of high school you can get drafted out of college you could be third year eligible two year eligible there's so many different paths that you could take you can go to a jc and just go for one year and then re-enter the draft. Um, but the end game for all these guys is MLB. Yeah, and do you have to go through like, because I always felt like in terms of young people wanting to play the game, it's still one of the first sports that young people are put in front of them, soccer, baseball. Yep. And then it seems like, at least in New York, these kids, the good athletes end up like slowly transitioning and phasing out. And then one of the things I've heard is just like, the allure of being in the NBA or the allure of being in the NFL and how big it feels and how instant it feels. Whereas like in baseball, you take these years before you make money. Is that been something you think that's hurt like young people's connection with the game? Yeah, I think so. I think this generation, um, because of like the instant gratification of like when you get drafted, you know, in the NBA out of high school, when it was out of high school, you're going to the NBA. I got drafted out of, you know what I'm saying? Like I got drafted out of high school and I went to, Burlington, North Carolina, like nobody saw me for two years. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's different when, um, you know, when you don't go instantly to the NFL or to, you know, the big TV. I think, you know, just understanding now, like us getting older, understanding the path that I took out of high school, 
is a lot harder than, you know, I, I actually realized, you know, coming out of high school. I think for me and, and getting a chance to see my son's path, I think for me, like going to college is the best way. Like being able to, to mature, get older, come out and, and be ready, like as physically and mentally to play baseball. Because baseball is based on failure. Like if you succeed three out of 10 times, you're a Hall of Famer. Yeah. So it's all about failure. So you have to learn how to lose. And I think the older you get, um, you, you, you can accept that a little better and it's, it's, it's easier to be a professional. And was minor league life beneficial to the growth? Like it feels very antiquated. It's, yeah, it's tough, man. I mean, you, you lived a minor league life. It's, yeah. uh, it's a tough life. I mean, and you got to develop and you got to realize these major league teams have players and, and they're not just, you know, they're coming from different out, other countries now that you're competing with. So these young college kids have to know how hard it is to actually get there and just, you know, and stay yeah. focused. I think I got lucky because I was in the Cleveland organization where they didn't have a lot of pitching and I kind of like developed, you know, a, lo a little faster than they thought. And they were just kind of moving me up the line. So I think, you know, a year and a half after a year, I got drafted after a year and a half, I was in the big leagues. but. That's not a normal path. It was just something that, you know, it kind of worked out for me. I read something that like you rep Hunter Green and the Reds and I read a conversation or something that was had between the two of you about the value potentially of playing in a smaller market as like you look at your whole career. Um, did you see that firsthand with your guys experience in Cleveland and yeah, CC I mean, in Cleveland? Everything I, t I tell my guys that I rep like. I'm not going to tell you how to pitch and I'm not going to tell you, you know, w what we could do on your fastball, but I could tell you from my experience of things that I've done that I lived through that I know. And, you know, a lot of the guys are like, look, like, look at, look at CeCe, you know, why not? You got the playbook, you know? So they're like, you know, they take my advice and they really take it to heart. And Hunter felt like that was great advice that I gave him, you know, starting in a small market, proving yourself growing with that team. And, you know, you become a free agent. We see where you go from there. But it, it's hard to develop as a young player in these markets. Like think about the young players that came here and like did great. Derek Jeter, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like it's so, because the Yankees- Name another the, one. That's what <laughs> right. I'm saying. Like <laughs> Aaron, you know what I'm saying? Like it's, they're 20 year, it's a 20 year gap in between young players that can develop here in New York in any sport. Like look at what Daniel Jones is going through right now. Like you have to win here. So, and if you ain't putting up Zach Wilson, you know what I'm saying? Like if he was in a different market, maybe have a chance to like develop and actually I mean, you never, you know what I'm saying? You never know. Like when you come here, you have to win. And when you're young and you're trying to find your footing in the league, it's really hard, man, if you don't have a good team around you or, you know, you're not in a good organization. So I felt like, you know, starting in a smaller market for me, letting you make mistakes, figure out, you know, how to grow up and be a professional, all these different things. And then coming to a place like here, Boston, Philly, uh, LA, uh, was a better path for, for somebody like you me. You were reluctant to go to New York. No, I never wanted to come here. That blew my mind. Nah, I tried everything I could to not come. I was calling all around <laughs> trying, trying not to come to so New York. So Cashman shows up on your couch Yeah, your it was just a bunch of, you know, you know, coming here to New York, like I said, like you have to win right away. You, I felt like you don't get any grace with the media. Um, and then, you know, G and A-Rod had their thing going on in the clubhouse. I was like, I don't want to be no part of that. And then Cash came to our our house doing free agency and kind of convinced us and was like, you know, we, I'm so convinced that you guys will like it here that we'll give you an opt out after three years. And I was like, you know, we, we can do three years in New York and ended up being the best decision we made 15 years later. Did you want New York at the time? I wanted to go where he, wherever he wanted to go, but I wasn't scared of New York. And the one thing I said to him, as I said, you want to go play for a team that wants you and New York wants you. Yeah, so. she was the one that convinced me to cut because I was like, I still wasn't convinced. And she was like, you got to go somewhere where they want you. Like, the Yankees want you. I know you don't want to go there, but they want you, so they'll make it work. It's so wild because, like, somebody, when we were prepping for this interview, was like, they're from New York, right? And I was like, duh. Um, but but, but by the way, I say all the time, like, we were born in California, and Vallejo we, raised us, but New York made us. Yeah. And I feel like New York had a huge part of why we're sitting here today. Do the years in Cleveland still hold this incredible weight for you in terms of your career and both of your guys' oh, yeah. time there? Yeah, the three of our children were born in, there. Um, it was where we really grew up together and built a family and had ups, had downs. And then when we came to New York, of course, I mean, it, there's still ups and downs, but we were a, a unit by the time we got here. Yeah, I feel like I grew from a boy into a man to, in Cleveland. You know, like I got there at 17, left at 28 and, you know, three kids and one of Cy Young. Only thing I didn't do there that I wanted to accomplish was win the World Series. 
and it was my fault. Like it was on me. Like I, I had a chance to do that and couldn't get it done. But like, no, I mean, I, I still hold incredible weight. Like, I mean, we, we go back there and still do stuff in the community. And, you know, that's that's like home for us. What do you see for yourself in building your career right now? Because I know you work with AJ Andrews, female softball player, and that comes with a whole other other set of challenges as, you know, we invest and support women's sports and try to figure out ways to level the playing field a bit. It's a long game, though. Yes. Um, and sadly, some of the players of today won't even benefit from some of the kind of platforms that they're creating yeah, to speak now. about it. Um, and then on baseball, obviously, you have this, like, proprietary information that you can offer kids and you see the game mm -hmm. from your eyes working in the league and from your own experience and you know what the game needs so right. what is your goal for yourself in this role my goal is to the clients that I have and the clients that I get in the future to help them as much as I can to be successful on and off the field now I can't go on the field and do the work for them but what what I know and what I've been through in CeCe's career and in this game and the relationships that I've built um, I feel like I have a, a level up that I could really support players. And I said to one of my guys, you know, 19 years from now, if I'm still sitting here, then I know I did my job, you know. And I was like, because once when CC 19 year career and he retired and, you know, I was like, I felt like, OK, I, I can now move on. And CC made the comment to somebody, I, I'm going to share her now. And so he's sharing me with, you know, uh, with other clients and going back to AJ, um, you know, helping her just build her career outside of softball because the professional softball salary is not going to cut it. Um, and she's such a talent that I feel like she has so much more that she can offer. So I'm excited to be part of her journey and helping her. Um, and then same with my guys, you know, helping them off field in, in their career and giving them as much advice and, you know, connections and things that I've learned in the game is 20 years from now, I've done my job. Are you guys worried about the sport? In regards to just being black in baseball is also like one of the things that, you know, CeCe's very hands-on with. But in terms of the overall growth, the perception of the sport, the young, um, young kids from America, young black kids from America, and how little of them are mm -hmm, focusing playing. and going yeah. after baseball as a sport. I mean, if you, kept this trajectory where do you see the game in 10 years yeah i mean well it kept this trajectory after i mean before we made these changes to the game now where we got the pitch clock we got the uh the shift has opened up the field you know i think this year not not i think i know this year we had 70 million fans come to the ballparks this year which is the most since 2016. so you know the attendance is up 11 percent the game's in a good spot like people are watching the game as far as, as us playing the game, that's something that's, that's going to be a lifelong mission, I think, for me. Um, because the way that the game is, is today, it's a country club sport. So somebody like me that grew up in Vallejo in the inner city, I wouldn't have had a chance to play in, in this in field. I wouldn't, have had, I wouldn't have had a chance to make it in the way it is now. With the perfect games and all these different things that you have to pay, pay to, to get play. seen and pay to, to play. There was no way somebody like me would Wait, have been able to. Explain that. I didn't even understand that. Well, because I didn't have enough money to go play in these these big tournaments and to get seen. And that's how it is now. Yeah, because yeah, everything's rankings, right? Everything is rankings, and it make, and so these big tournaments, whether it's Perfect Game or PVR, they make it easy for scouts. So they had this big tournament down in Atlanta, and all the best kids are coming there. So all the scouts will go there. So if I can't fly down from California to go to Atlanta to that tournament, I'm not getting seen. So the scouts aren't coming to those little pockets anymore to go see the players. They're just getting the, they're going to see the top 300 players at this tournament down yeah, here. Yeah, if so. you can't afford the plane ticket, the hotel, the food, and by the way, you can't pay for these kids to do it. So it's hard for them, to, they can't get like, you know, scholarships in and, you know, like uh, in other sports. So it's hard for, you know, for them to get down there. So they're just not going to be seen. Yeah, so I mean, I think with the, the mission of the Players Alliance is to, you know, make these avenues, you know, to, and open these avenues back up for, you know, more players of brown and, and black descent to be able to play baseball. I think growing up when I was watching the game, when we was watching the game in the 80s and 90s, it was so many different players I could look to, whether it was Ken Griffey Jr. or Dave Stewart or Dave Parker or Ellis Burks. It was so many different guys in the league. And I think now the black guys that you see in the league are all superstars. Like if you ain't an all-star, you're not in the league. So um, I think that needs to change too. Wow, that like with all the access and all the connection now, that there's less exposure for kids yeah, from underserved communities it. in America. That's wild. Yeah. Whereas in the 80s with no social media, 
someone would find you. Yeah. And AAU basketball, if some kid can play, it doesn't matter. They're going to find a way to find them. Yeah. yeah. No, so that's it's, crazy. It's, it's completely different now. And all the scouts just come to converge on one spot instead of trying to go out and, and yeah. look for kids. And a lot of and a lot of teams have really cut their scouting department out because they, they pay for analytics and different data. So they don't even scout anymore because they can just go to these tournaments and see the top 300 kids. So that's crazy. Yeah, but I think I think that's going to change with the rule changes. So I think you're going to need more athletes now. Like you can't just put a, a big guy at second base and that can hit that can't cover the field because now you got to ha- you, you need athletes to be able to what range to be able to, to catch ground balls and catch fly balls and stuff. So it changes who you draft. So it changes the way you scout. When I asked the question, you went into like straight commissioner voice, bro. <laughs> right? You really did. <laughs> You like turn, I love baseball, man. You really do. I do. I and, do. And I, I didn't think I did that much. I do, though. And I, and I heard, um, you, like, someone that you work with talked about how you're in the office, like, the commissioner. Like, you're in every morning. You're well, no, in. I don't know. I'm not in the office every morning. I, I'm, there, I'm there a lot. Enough. Enough. But I'm not, <laughs> I, I do have an office, and I'm there. Um, but like I said, I, I just love the game, and I love being around, and I love trying to understand who's making decisions and how decisions get made and... You know, um, I want to be a part of that because I don't feel like there's been a lot of players in those rooms. Um, and, and, and I think I, we can change that. You know, you look at like what Rich Paul has been able to do in the sport of basketball and on behalf of players and, and not just Rich Paul. I think there's a, an entire group of agents and agencies that have really like started to be player first and have a more holistic view on building an athlete's career and life. Like what you do with Ken. With Ken. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I was going to say myself. <laughs> um, but I, I think you can do that. Like, do you feel like that's something I, I, I keep referencing things like I really prepped for that long, but I also read that someone said that you were like the queen of cool and you are, you're flawlessly cool. And I think that for young athletes, that's an important thing to see from their people now, right, to see right. from their team. Do you, do you think that's a big part of how you can impact? Yeah, can I tell you, like, I read something about you. Oh, shit. Where you said, you know, how you guys call yourselves partners. And I feel like with my athletes, with my guys, like, we're partners in this. Like, you don't have to listen to what I say, but and I want to hear all your ideas, and I want you to bounce your ideas. So my clients, I feel like we're going into this together. And whether it's branding, marketing, on-field, off-field, all these different entities, we're, we're partners. And so I want to help them. So... Yeah, we do, you know, we do some fun, cool stuff. We do some, you know, like you're at the MOB office with marketing and we're doing the rooftop shots and all those kind of fun things. But any ideas, whether it's giving back or, you know, throwing a surprise party for their mom, you know, I just want to be there to support them. But I think she understands too that like, you can't build a brand unless you build yourself on the field. Like you can build, you can do all this stuff off the field, all that. And when the times come, when it comes down time to pitch, you better be able to deliver. You know what I mean? So I think, and I was always like, I didn't want to do anything unless I'm pitching well or if I'm playing well. So I think like she understands the good balance of, you know, yeah, maybe you need to push and do this or maybe you need to hold off, you know? So I think she has a good feel on that. I always felt like, especially guys in my generation, felt like we, like baseball players, we aren't marketable. You know, so like, why even worry about that? You know, like, I, I really do feel like that. Like a bunch of the players are just like, you know, we get paid so much and it's guaranteed and we get paid more than any other sport at the time. Um, it's not that way anymore that, you know, we never even really wor- worried about marketing. So I think the agents just didn't even, cause nobody was pushing for that. You know, if you think about like the biggest baseball player was King Griffey Jr. And like he had his Nike shoe, but it wasn't like, he should have been on like every single commercial back in the nineties. You know what I mean? And you know, he had the video game, but it wasn't as big as, like, he was the Michael Jordan of baseball. Yeah. And and it was just, you know, it's but, baseball. It, but it's so a we new just, wave now. It's, like, a, it's new a new wave. It's a new generation now. It's a new generation. These, these players want that. And yeah. so it's it's my obligation and as an agent to, to do that. But think about that. Like, what we remember about Griffey is the swag, is the hat backwards. And he built that persona for himself. Or maybe his agency did. Nike helped out. But that ultimately will grow the game. Michael Jordan grew the game for what he did on and off the court. You know, LeBron has grown the game for what he's done on and off the court. And I do think that, you know, when you have an Otani or an Aaron Judge, there's an opportunity now to, you know, on their back as much as they want to grow the game. Jeter didn't want to do everything, but still knew how to carry the game on his back. That's like Mike Trout, same way. 
you know, when he's the, the biggest game, the biggest star in the game, didn't want to be out there necessarily as much, but does different things to put the game on his back. But I think you're right, like Aaron Judge, Otani, like these different guys, they, they want to be the face of baseball and want to carry, especially as a lot of these Latin guys, uh, Julio Rodriguez, there's a bunch of guys that can Lindor. be that next guy. Yeah, Francisco Lindor, too. Well, the one thing it isn't is when people think the league needs to do more. I always think that's a cop out. Like the league needs to push these guys more because it, it doesn't work as simple as that. And people don't buy always what the big corporation is going to sell mm -hmm. you. It's not going to be about like how many times Otani's on a, a commercial during a baseball game. It's more than that. You know what I mean? To grow the game. Well, before I let you guys go, it's first of all crystal clear that you are, whether you like it or not, the first couple of baseball. <laughs> because it's like we're talking about baseball, but we're really talking about like this sport, like you said, that's a family business and is like the yeah. backdrop to your guys' entire life. Yeah. And I think it's incredible because I do think if people like yourselves moved on, which you could have, you put a long ass time in, you put a long ass time right. in. Right you could have just kicked back and moved on because you do like the golf. Yes, right. I do. Yes, <laughs> but it's cool to see that you feel this responsibility. I would imagine that there's other dreams. I see like the Oakland A's moving to Vegas and I just like think to myself like, this is somebody who's probably like talking to Amber at home about how we want to own how a piece we get of the Oakland A's. I got, I got a player on the A's, so he's excited yeah. with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, do you have, like beyond growing the game, do you see you guys ever wanting to own a team and like locking in in that way? So you had talked about ownership um, and never say never, but I think right now where we are in both of our careers, we're very impactful in, in our position, but we really enjoy it because it's for us both. I think it's more about mentorship for CC with the players and, and being in the different clubhouses as opposed to just being in one clubhouse right now. Yeah, I think for me right now, um, I'm, I'm not ready to be singularly focused on the A's winning one game in September. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm, I'm ready to, be, I'm more focused on like the whole growing the sport of the game, like from the league office right now. So maybe in five, 10 years, like I'll be back in that competitive mode where, you know, I want to see my team win every single day. But right now I'm less about, you know, my team winning that one game and, and growing the whole sport and trying to figure out how we can, you know, surpass 75 million fans next year. Amber, Cece, thank you guys so much. Um, I think it's clear you truly are, like I said, the first family of baseball, and I appreciate you guys joining the show. Please download, subscribe, log on, www.boardroom.tv. Thank you guys. See you on the other side. Thank you for having us. Yo, Lillard, Lillard to the Bucks. Shut up, it happened? Lillard to the Bucks. Woo hoo hoo! Lillard to the bus. Damn.